PowerPoint. I'm going to read uh, just the first paragraph of my paper, or the first part of it. Um, Mounting empirical research suggests that violations of religious freedom and agency, both by governments and powerful social actors, tend to reinforce oppressive structures that marginalize or prevent integration of impoverished people, exploited women, migrants, ethnic and religious minorities, and outcasts. Protections of religious agency, on the other hand, particularly the right to practice, interpret, criticize, or change one's faith, act as powerful engines of empowerment and integration of otherwise marginal people. <clears throat> I suggest that we are at a unique moment uh, in human history in which we actually have the capacity to test broad propositions that have been proffered throughout the ages about why conscience rights and religious freedom matter. So we have, and I have been a part of uh, a broad effort funded by uh, the Pew Research Center and the Templeton Foundation, anchored at Georgetown University and Baylor University, uh, to document the value uh, of global religious freedom. So we now have unprecedented global data of uh, uh, rig religious restriction measures by the Pew Research Center. And these are ingenious because rather than trying to measure some in indefinable quality of freedom, they objectively measure the number of restrictions on religious freedom, both by governments and social actors. We also have a project at uh, bar Ilan University that documents every relationship between church and state in the world. We have polity democracy scores, global terrorism databases, global corruption data. We have Freedom House data on the levels of freedom around the world, which actually track very closely with the level of restrictions on religion. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to synthesize some of the research uh, that we're seeing uh, that documents the value of religious freedom and agency around the world. Um, so here are a brief, so here are the brief points of summary. Violations of religious freedom and agency undermine integration of the marginalized. Repression of religious agency produces cycles of persecution, instability, and violence. Religious discrimination, in fact, serves, I, I, I submit, as a major driver of marginalization in numerous societies. Uh, think of Baha'is in, in Iran and Ahmadiyyas in Pakistan and Christians in Egypt. Um, protections of religious agency, in fact, promote empowerment and integration socially, politically, and economically. This chart comes from a book, The Price of Freedom Denied, and its correlations of religious freedom or low levels of restrictions on religion, as measured by the Pew Research Center, to other social outcomes. And you'll notice the strongest are political freedom, freedom of the press, civil liberties, and gender empowerment which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, which is actually a paradoxical finding to many people who think that somehow religion must be oppressive of women and therefore uh, it's paradoxical. Now, I'm gonna start by framing why religious agency or why religious freedom matters. And I'm gonna suggest four aspects of why religious freedom matters, why we actually have to pay attention to religion in the 21st century. The first is because religion matters. Secularization, which is, as you all know, the secularization thesis predicted that as the globe became more, as societies modernized uh, and, um, and became more technological and so forth, that religion would fade. In fact, secularization peaked in 1970. And all over the world, religious communities began to push against secularization. And according to Pew demographic studies, because secular people do not have babies and religious people do, um, we're actually going to see a decrease in the number of non-religious or non-affiliated people in the globe. In other words, the world is becoming more religious. And by 2050, it says it will be 13%, but in fact, because the Pew Research Center cannot estimate the growth of Christianity in China, it's probably going to be less than 13%, because we know that that's happening. Also, 
religious movements and communities are more globally independent and powerful than ever, according to God's Century, a book by Toffville, Pot, and Shaw. And finally, I would submit that anthropologically, the reality is religion anchors forms of identity, meaning, community, purpose, especially for the marginalized. So if we're concerned about marginalization and exclusion, we cannot avoid religion. Religious agency matters also because religious diversity matters. The ontological condition of religion is diversity. Uh, the famous sociologist Peter Berger, who was an original secularization theorist, said, I was wrong. Modernization and globalization don't bring secularity, they bring plurality. We're everywhere, everyone is everywhere. We were now cheek to jowl with religious others. And efforts to impose religious uniformity, whether by governments or dominant social groups, are increasingly untenable, repressive, and disruptive. Religious agency matters in international law, and I'm not going to belabor this. This is the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the preamble, and then Article 18, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. That right includes the freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. And I highlight the dimensions of the components of what religious freedom or religious agency is in international law. It's inherent dignity, equal worth, reason, conscience, and community. Very powerful forces in international law and in politics. The third reason why, the final reason why religious agency matters is because it's massively denied. The Pew Research Center measures restrictions on religion, and according to them, 75% um, of the world's population live with high restrictions on their religious practice, either by government actions or by hostile social forces, mob violence, and so forth. And so this involves government repression or favoritism, social hostility, hostility mob violence, often with impunity, state authorities looking the other way uh, when um, when mob violence takes place against religious minorities. And the point I want to make is this redounds especially on religious and ethnic minorities, women and migrants. So the, 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 the treatment of minority religious faith and communities often redounds against those who would push against the dominant narrative. Now, these two tables I'm just providing as illustrations of the kind of data that we now have. The, the reason I said we're at a unique moment in human history, when we have data on 198 countries, measures on a score of one to 10 on the degree of religious restrictions. And this table, the one on the left, shows that um, the Mideast and North Africa has the highest levels of um, uh, social hostilities and uh, and then on the table on the right, it shows that about 100 countries, it's a little hard to read, uh, have uh, high restrictions by, um, uh, by uh, um, government harassment. So we have this enormous data that now scholars are able to correlate with everything from economic performance, peace, stability, and so forth. So the bulk of my paper is devoted to developing uh, the dimensions, at least that I synthesize from the scholarship, uh, of what I call religious agency and dimensions of human flourishing. So these are the components I look at. Sustainable development, women's empowerment, integration of minorities and outsiders, civil society and democracy, and antidotes to violence. Uh, I gave a, a TEDx talk and I said, in effect, imagine you know, a social force, a potent X factor that um, uh, supports civil society, underpins democracy, reduces uh, civil violence, increases uh, interreligious amity, increases gender empowerment. And, and it's, it's inconceivable, but it actually is corroborated that religious freedom does in fact contribute to all of these aspects of social flourishing. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a magic bullet. It's not uh, the only factor, obviously, but you cannot understand, in my view, democracy, civil society, gender empowerment, peace, interreligious harmony without understanding the way in which protections of religious agency matter. 
So let's take a look at um, the research that's being done on sustainable development. The definition of sustainable development, which comes from the United Nations, I believe, is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It also has a dimension of development that is uh, broadly uh, applicable to all sectors of society. This is what is striking to me. Uh, uh, one of the best scholars in this field is a, uh, is a sociologist of religion, Brian Grimm, who actually developed the measures for the Pew Research Center's Global Restrictions Reports, actually developed the ways of documenting and then measuring uh, the level of restrictions on religion, both by government and social actors. So Grimm and his associates actually took econometric models. They took all of the factors that economists use to predict gross domestic product. In other words, tariff rates and population levels and education levels and um, debt levels and ex government expenditures. In other words, every factor that an economist could think of that would predict gross domestic product. But they added two other factors that economists don't usually look at the level of measurable restrictions uh, by governments on religious freedom and the measure of religious hostilities by social actors. So of 25 factors in a structural equation model controlling for all these other variables, uh, Grimm and his associates found that only four had measurable independent impact on gross domestic product growth. Religious restrictions, religious hostilities, five-year GDP growth, and monetary freedom. And yet economists have not caught up to the fact that societies in which governments repress religious activity actually has a huge impact on entrepreneurial activity and so forth. We'll have, we'll have plenty of time for conversation. What's that? Well, monetary freedom, it, it was defined by whatever measures he was using. So I, I'm, I, I couldn't, it's whatever objective measures that economists tend to use. What was five-year GDP growth? Um, <clears throat> this means that um, the, there are only four factors that statistically demonstrated an impact on the growth of GDP, growth domestic product growth increases over, over time. Yeah, but one, one of them is five Yes, because in a sense, the five-year, the, the prior GDP growth predicks future GDP growth. The prior five, the prior five years. So, so in other words, it was a factor. It was a factor. Um, so the, the, the point here is that um, this is a power, that, that this is, uh, these are powerful new variables for economic research. Um, this is what uh, uh, Brian Grimm and his Religious Freedom and Business Foundation lists as seven ways he claims and documents religious freedom contributes to sustainable development. Uh, fosters respect among civil society actors, reduces corruption. In fact, there, there's high degrees of correlation between corruption and governments that collude with dominant religious actors to curry favor. Think of Putin's Russia for example, uh, engenders peace, encourages broader freedoms, develops the economy, overcomes overregulation, and regulation of religion is actually pervasive around the world. Most governments have religious affairs bureaus that regulate religious activity, and finally multiplies trust. Here's another factor that I think is quite surprising and paradoxical in many cases. Religious agency and women's empowerment there's a powerful correlation between religious freedom and gender empowerment. And this seems paradoxical because religious, religion seems a source of repression of women, particularly patriarchal structures and so forth. But it, it misunderstands what religious agency means. Religious agency implies choice, voice, exit, social freedom to create your own social networks of support and, and so forth. States and dominant religious groups often conspire to constrict this agency and cement oppressive structures against women. And when women can exercise religious agency and choice, it unleashes social and economic agency. 
Uh, and so I'm going to draw upon some amazing research by Rebecca Shaw, former World Bank economist and researcher for Templeton Foundation, who focuses on the behavioral aspects uh, from people like Amartya Sen and others of economic uplift of poor women, dignity, agency, hope for the future, and self-control, and certain attitudes and, 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 uh, and attributes that actually lead to economic uplift. And she argues that spiritual capital, a sense of agency for God, a sense of, of one's worth and dignity um, uh, from the transcendent it is actually a fungible resource that can be invested in other ways. And she's investigated thousands of poor women in Asia and Africa, especially focused on Dalit women in India. So let's talk about Dalit women and religious agency. Dalits, or untouchables, are actually termed broken uh, a, a term often used, uh, represents a huge marginalized population, maybe 200 million or more in India. Uh, and women Dalits are doubly marginalized. They're both women and they're untouchables. What Rebecca Shaw finds is that religious agency and ex exit and voice, the capacity to choose new religious identities is empowering, to break out and break free of cultural and legal straitjackets. Dalits who converted, especially to Christianity, demonstrated agency in other aspects of their lives, self-respect, hope, future orientation. And this is what is fascinating. They're more likely to be successful in micro-enterprise, more likely to report domestic abuse, more likely to invest in their children's education, and more likely to save for home ownership. In fact, let me go back to um, um, <clears throat> this point again. Um, investigating all of these women, she finds that she actually, by quite by accident, discovered a large sample of these Dalit women she was investigating, women who were involved in microenterprise, who were converting from Hinduism, which consigned them to an untouchable status, to Islam, Buddhism, Christianity. And when they converted, it, in a sense, gave them a new source of transcendent agency, a sense of worth and dignity. Um, and, um, and in fact, something I find very powerful, I, it's in the paper, I didn't put it in the slides, is that she found that Dalit women who convert to Christianity have developed, and, and men as well, a theology, a brokenness, that Jesus Christ on the cross was a, was a Dalit was a broken, was a shattered person. And therefore, they have the same equal worth and dignity as the Son of God. And it's a powerful source of their sense of uplift and agency. Um, what about religion and the great problem of displaced people and migrants and guest workers and so forth? Um, once again, this is a fascinating new area of research that, that Refugees, immigrants, and guest workers are often religious others. Um, and religious discrimination intensifies their mod marginalization. If you think about Saudi Arabia, where Christianity is illegal to practice in public, there are millions of guest workers who are Christians or Hindus or Buddhists from Asia. Um, and they're completely marginalized. So they're, they're, they're not only exploited as guest workers, but they're further marginalized because of their religion. Um, but there are also less obvious ones, like Japan, where there are a lot of guest workers, but it's hard for the Japanese to conceive as someone who, is, who can be Japanese or who, who can have full participation in society uh, who's not a part of that culture, homogenous culture. And of course, the flood of Syrian and Afri Afghan refugees is leading, according to Pew Research Center, to increases in government restrictions on religion in Europe and the United States. Let's look at religious agency and civil society. Uh, in a previous paper for the Pontifical Academy, I've documented the powerful correlation between religious freedom and democratization. Uh, Daniel Philpott has looked at this. Uh, pluralist religious communities anchor vibrant civil societies. This is illustrated by the Catholic example uh, when the Catholic Church embraced religious freedom, the Dignitatis Humanae, it led to the last great wave of democratization on earth. 
um, but it's also illustrated negatively in Sharia-based societies that have sanctions on apostasy, which tend to repress not just um, not just those who want to change their religion, but even to Muslims who might want to question their religion. Uh, and we also know that, uh, that the outcomes of the Arab Spring, or the Arab uprising, was not a spring, um, hinged in a large part on the lack of protections for religious freedom. The only place where it seemed to succeed in Tunisia, there was more of a religious civil society that operated. Anti-conversion laws serve to repress religious minorities and civil society, according to Ani Sarkeesian at Michigan State. And repression of religious civil society actually predicts the trajectory of authoritarian hybrid states. Those authoritarian hybrid states that allow more room for uh, religious civil society are more likely to move in a dem democratic direction. Now I want to turn to uh, something I call the locus effect. I'm borrowing this from a book by Gary Haugen who testified a year ago at our um, plenary session on trafficking or two years ago. Um, um, and he argues that, um, that uh, it, it, the book is called The Locus Effect, Why the End of Poverty Requires the End of Violence. That because of weak or corrupt justice systems in many countries around the world, there is impunity for those who violently exploit the poor. And this actually dramatically enhances the marginalization of people out through trafficking and forced labor and, and exploitation. A major source of economic and social marginalization is trafficking, slavery, expropriation of, expropriation of property. Um, and religious discrimination and persecution is a tool of states and dominant groups to further marginalize minority religious and ethnic communities. So let's take a look at examples, I call them examples, of the locus effect. And the, the, the image here is you can have microenterprise, you can have economic development happening in a society, and all it takes is, is a war, a civil strife, to wipe out gener a generation of economic progress. The locusts come and devour the harvest. Um, Repression of religion is spurring religious civil wars. And religious civil wars, as Tafil Pot and Shaw argue, are nasty, brutish, and long. They're hard to end. They're more intractable. They're devastating on the poor and on women who are often subject to uh, the most violent kinds of exploitation in these conflicts. And it's a rising source of global instability, violence, and refugees. And this documentation is from God's Century, the book God's Century. In 1940, only 19% of all civil wars were religious. By the year 2000, it's 50%. So for good or ill, religion is a powerful force on the global stage, and repression of religion appears to be driving uh, some of the most intractable uh, civil wars. Um, and scholars, several scholars I'm citing here, also are documenting the actual impact of religious repression on war. Um, Will Inboden, who used to work for the National Security Council in the United States, documented that every war in the last century plus that engaged free societies involved states that were ideologically opposed to religious freedom. Uh, Nalay Seya at uh, Sunni Brockport documented that no dyad of religiously free states has ever fought on opposite sides of a major war. And the eradication of religious pluralism, this is something Will Inboneman looked at, an agency is epistemically central to the ideology of all jihadist movements, Boko Haram, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, uh, etc. All of them actually justify their their violence on the basis of attempting to eliminate religious diversity, to impose a single vision of religion. So it's not just incidental, it's not just bloodlust. This actually explains uh, the nature of uh, this kind of violence. And modern terrorism arises primarily from religious repressively, re religiously repressive societies and states. And so let me develop this with some work by Nalay Seya. He analyzed, this is the thing about the modern world, we have data, we have data on terror incidents, we have data on democracy and freedom and, and religious restrictions. So he analyzed all the religious-based terrorist violence in the post-Cold War era, several hundred cases. 
He statistically analyzed data from the Pew Global Restriction Reports, Polity Scores on Democracy, and the Global Terrorism Database. And he found that 88% of all terrorist groups originate from religiously repressive states which tend to produce militant theologies. Where religion is more free, you get less theolo theologies, of, uh, less militant theologies. And terrorist attacks increase as, measurable, uh, increase as measurable religious restrictions decrease. So in religiously free states, only 7% of terrorist incidents happen. 24% in moderately restrictive, and 66% of all terrorist attacks happen on states that are religiously repressive. The other thing that the Laisea did that was fascinating is he controlled for democracy because some democracies are religiously restrictive. They have restrictions on religion. And he found that that actually predicted equally well uh, religious violence. In other words, illiberal democracies also produced violence. So to amend Immanuel Kant's famous proposition of the religious, of the democ democratic peace, he said it's really the religious freedom peace. These are the pathways to, to peace that he discussed, uh, which I think summarize a lot of what uh, the research suggests. When people can practice their faith free from government restrictions and social hostilities, religious violence goes down. Religious liberty frees people to provide social services and channels their energies in civil society participation. Free exercise of religion works against authoritarianism and tyranny by limiting the state reach and lowering the stakes of political power, seizing power. If seizing political power will determine what religion is the dominant religion, it increases the importance of religious. And religious freedom fosters an open marketplace of ideas uh, and, a, and diversity of views between and within religious groups. And restrictive environments tend to facilitate the radical theologies um, that enable people to question, uh, that prevent people uh, from questioning their faith. Now, I want to turn in my last just few minutes here to a separate project that um, dovetails with this one. It was, a, it, was a, it was an initiative initially by Tim Shaw and myself at Georgetown to just kind of correct to the record, the do dominant enlightenment record that Christianity was hostile to freedom. You had to bracket Christianity or, 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 or marginalize it in order to have liberal freedoms. But what we discovered and we commissioned some 30 scholars, 15 historians, 15 political contemporary scholars, to look at both the historical record and the contemporary record. And what we discovered, and I'll go back to this uh, for a moment, is that Christianity, in fact, um, has, a, it has played historically and in contemporary times a powerful role in um, developing ideas and practices of free societies. Uh, religious freedom, limited government, human rights, democracy, and so forth. This is relevant because there is a global crisis of Christian persecution today. Christian minorities around the world suffer marginalization, exclusion, violence, and martyrdom. More Christians in more diverse settings experience government and social repression than any other religious group. Some 500 million Christians, about 22% of the global total of Christianity live in states where they're subject to persecution. And they're concentrated in some very repressive states. So in some 60 countries, 80% of all incidents of repression against religious minorities are against Christians. And you would never know this by sort of reading the popular press. So it deserves attention as a major manifestation of marginalization, but also for the sake of dignity and freedom. And this is why. Uh, because of the Christian concept of Imago Dei, that we are made in the image and likeness of God and have surpassing equal worth and dignity, Christianity propelled the development of civic, economic, and political freedoms from antiquity to today. That's what we discovered in these two volumes, that there was a, there was a tremendous correspondence between the historical record and the record of today. The Christian idea of universal dignity led to critiques of slavery, sexual exploitation, and callous treatment of the poor in the late Roman Empire. Today, similarly, Christian networks for dignity play an outsized role in combating human trafficking, poverty, illiteracy, and religious persecution. Christian minorities under conditions of hardship leaven their society by promoting human rights, civil society, religious pluralism, and limits on state power. So these are my summary reflections. 
Religion is natural to human anthropology. Repression of faith fuels division, destabilizes societies, and undermines integration. The very Christian association with freedom invites repression by states and social actors hostile to this independence. Therefore, even if you're not a Christian, votaries of free, inclusive societies have a stake in the fate of vulnerable Christian communities around the world. Thanks very much.